He starts out cool, simply demanding cash. But then, fiery violence. He's fast, tough, and well protected. Investigators vow to catch him and risk their own lives to do it. At every turn, they face dangerous surprises from a violent felon on the run. Southwest, one serial bank robber claimed his loot went to the poor. But this thief was no folk hero. He had a gun and was willing to shoot. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The gunman was desperate to stay free, a threat to anyone in his way. The FBI and U.S. Marshals teamed up to capture a resourceful criminal who proved he would never stop fighting. Albuquerque, New Mexico. On December 29th, 1998, in the city's northeast section. For the employees and customers of a local bank, the day started much like any other. What they did not know was that a man who had already robbed one bank earlier that morning was about to make another withdrawal. When the robber approaches the teller, he asks her to give him money from the cash drawer. Okay, I have a gun, and this is a robbery. Mm -hmm. Trained to always comply with a robber's request and avoid any dangerous confrontation, the teller gives the man what he asks for, and more. She slips the man a bundle of cash containing an exploding dye pack. I have this gun, and I will use it, so... The robber slips out as quietly as he entered. Albuquerque 911, where is your emergency? This is a bank robbery. The alarm goes out to local police. And because bank robbery is a federal offense, the FBI. Special agents Scott Campbell and John Tanberg respond from the FBI's Albuquerque resident agency. It begins as a routine call for Special Agent Tanberg. Albuquerque has had per capita more than its uh, share of bank robberies. In the late 90s, we were uh, in the neighborhood of 90 to 100 bank robberies per year. Yet this case will be anything but routine. Agents learn the bandit was strangely calm. Most of the people in the bank had no idea that it had even been robbed. There was no commotion. There was no what they would think and had seen previously on TV of bank robberies with shots fired or people yelling. The tellers remember nothing distinctive about him. Well, this physical description that we received was of a uh, white male, possibly Hispanic, dark hair, average build, wearing sunglasses, uh, fairly neat haircut, wearing a ball cap, and. Uh, not very distinctive clothing. Despite a thorough examination, technicians recover no usable prints from the teller counter or doors. Appreciate that. They find no other physical evidence. We try. Investigators suspect an electronic witness may have observed the robber. The primary security countermeasure that a bank will have would be uh, surveillance cameras. Sometimes they're high quality, sometimes they're not. In this case, the cameras were not of much help. They show the robber, but the quality is not good. We didn't retrieve any significant information from the surveillance tapes of either of those two bank robberies. They weren't particularly good images. We didn't get a good angle. 
of uh, the face. I believe that there may have been a, a good shot of the top of his ball cap, but uh, nothing that gave us any significant facial features. The robbers simply walked into two banks in one day, took their cash, and walked out. He left no prints, no evidence, and beat the bank surveillance systems. He left the FBI nothing that would help them identify him. There wasn't a whole lot of information that we had to work with. We didn't believe that this was somebody that had uh, hit any of the Albuquerque area banks in the past. We uh, were not uh, in a position to connect him to anything that had occurred prior to this. So in our minds, this could potentially be a traveler. Take this thing, I'm going to call this in. Agents spread out across the area and talk with everyone who lived near the bank. They are looking for anyone who may have seen the robber. Anyone who could give them a positive ID. Agents get a break when they find a witness. A neighbor who lived behind the bank saw a man running out of the bank and around the corner back behind the bank. And then, a cloud of red mist. Agents realize it must have been the dye pack. This is their man. This witness provided a full license plate number of a vehicle registered in the state of Nevada. This confirms their suspicions. Respond, call three. The robber does not appear to be from Albuquerque. With that license plate, we ran through our dispatch center uh, registration in Nevada and came up with a registered owner and an address of um, the vehicle was registered at. But the address is to a motel off the Las Vegas Strip, perhaps a cover to throw off the cops. The agents have hit a dead end. They try another tack and run the plate number through a credit bureau. They get a hit. The FBI finds the loan is registered to another address in Wyoming. An agent there interviews the registered owner. He asks him where he was on the day the robberies occurred. For this position right now. The man replies he was in Wyoming, interviewing for his job as a postal worker, an alibi corroborated by his supervisor. He was a law-abiding citizen and did not have any knowledge of any uh, criminal activity that was, that was associated with his vehicle that uh, was in Albuquerque. The man explains he no longer has possession of the car. His ex-wife Carlita uses it, and she lives in Albuquerque. We eventually tracked down the ex-wife of the vehicle's owner. We made contact with her and spoke to her about her vehicle, where it had been, who had control of it, who has other keys to it and where it was the previous day during the time frame of the bank robberies. Carlita says that on the day of the robbery, she was at work. She explains she has a big family in the area and many people borrow her car. She did not know who had her car the previous day and that it should have been parked in its parking spot near her apartment. She did, however, tell us that the vehicle was a little lower on gas than what she had left it at. Carlita gives her consent for a search. Remembering from the previous day that the dye pack had exploded, we thought perhaps there would be evidence of uh, the red dye inside the vehicle. However, we did not find any. It's possible that the witness got the license plate number wrong. Possible, but not likely. I had reservations with what she had told us simply because it was too coincidental that this vehicle that was seen as the getaway vehicle at the robbery the previous day and registered in the state of Nevada was actually located in Albuquerque. No hard evidence links Carlita to the robberies, but something about this seems suspicious. Agents suspect there is some connection. 
although she did not remain a suspect, she remained a person that we wanted to stay in contact with and a person of interest in these investigations. Police and the FBI have exhausted their leads. The robberies go unsolved. And then, several months later, the mysterious bandit strikes again. He hits a series of banks in a very short period of time. His M.O. remains the same. He gets in, gets the cash, and gets out. And never leaves any evidence behind. Beginning in around the uh, middle of March of 1999 and continuing up through the end of May of 99, approximately six banks were robbed from the evidence that we had obtained uh, in the form of video surveillance descriptions by the witnesses and the bank tellers and just general demeanor, we came to the conclusion that we had a serial bank robber working in Albuquerque. Local police and the FBI must identify the lone bandit and stop him before someone gets hurt. A serial bank robber terrorizes Albuquerque, New Mexico, sometimes striking multiple banks in one day. Local police and the FBI work together to identify him and stop his rampage. As the bandit spree continues, he grows more aggressive, according to FBI Special Agent John Tanberg. He began to take more money by going behind the teller counters and causing the tellers to take money out of several teller drawers. The robber becomes more unpredictable and violent. Agents begin to fear that the longer he continues robbing banks, the more likely someone is going to get hurt or worse. There were occasions when it appeared that the offender may be utilizing narcotics because uh, there were occasions when he was quite physical with uh, people that uh, seemed very inappropriate. It appeared that the offender was becoming more and more desperate in that regard. He's now much more willing to use his gun. He surprises tellers by announcing the money will go to starving children in Mexico. After one robbery in June, the FBI gets better security camera photos of the gunman. With no physical evidence, the photos are agents' best lead. We like to have public interest uh, as active as possible when we have a serial offender. We'll get the media to cooperate and to place the uh, information into uh, the newspaper columns, television. People will uh, very often respond to Crime Stoppers and call in tips. Because the robber tends to hit in sprees and all the robberies took place in the northeast quadrant of Albuquerque, the agents stake out banks in the area. They hope they can set a trap and the robber will walk into it. But because they have so little to go on, the agents must rely on blind luck. They follow up on every tip, but nothing pans out. The uh, robber was getting more and more active. It was uh, becoming more and more desirable to arrest him and prosecute him. And uh, that becomes a little bit frustrating when uh, you have an offender that, that uh, you're not able to identify even though you have done your best efforts to do so. The robber never touched anything to produce any fingerprints that we could use as evidence. The robber uh, didn't leave anything behind. The FBI will need to appeal to the public for help. At one point, they need a hook to capture the public's imagination. The FBI bank robbery squad assigns nicknames to serial robbers. The media will latch on to the case a little bit better sometimes that way, and it gets the public interest up. The FBI dubs this one Robin the Hood for his dubious claims that the stolen cash goes to starving children. With each new robbery, local media jumps on the story, 
and the bandit likes the attention. Well, the robber seemed to revel in the name that we attached to him. He seemed to like the idea of being called Robin the Hood. There were occasions when he walked in and, and walked up to the victim teller and said, hey, you know who I am. I'm Robin the Hood. Despite the name, agents doubt the thief is giving his money away. They suspect that, like most bank robbers, he uses the cash to finance a drug habit or other criminal activities. Whoever he is, he's good, leaving no clues behind. Agents keep watching and waiting for him to strike again. It seems they are at the mercy of the bank robber. After 14 robberies, the only possible lead to Robin the Hood is Carlita's car. FBI Special Agent Scott Campbell keeps talking with her. I spoke to her on the phone probably five or six times throughout the eight months because in the back of my mind I knew that she had something to do with the robberies or she can provide some information or evidence that would uh, lead us to the robber. Finally, in August 1999, the case breaks open when Carlita, by now eight months pregnant, contacts Agent Campbell. Yes, with, uh, Agent she calls me and says, we need to talk. I have some information that'll solve the cases. She says the robber is her husband, Byron Chubbuck. She'll explain more in person. And so I make a time to meet her the next morning at her apartment. Agents pull Chubbuck's record and learn he's got a history of violence and gang affiliations. I'm not sure what's in St. Louis. Maybe. Carlita said she can talk now because Chubbuck moved to St. Louis. Agents had offered a more secure location for the interview, but she declined. I think she is. I mean, I just, uh, she said that she didn't feel that there was any danger, that uh, she was with him when he had loaded his truck and had. Uh, uh, departed for St. Louis, so she felt safe and secure being interviewed at her apartment, and she insisted that we interview her there. Still, agents approach with caution, wanting to avoid a surprise confrontation with Chubbuck. Prior to going in the apartment, I made a phone call into the apartment to see if he was around and if she had any other information on him since we spoke uh, the evening before. Once we were comfortable that he was not around, I radioed into our dispatch using our car radios to tell them the address we were going to be at. As we entered the apartment, Agent Tamber and I just made a quick uh, cursory look around to ensure that no one else was there. Carlita positively identifies the man in the bank photos as Byron Chubbuck. She confirms he's a member of Albuquerque's notorious Brewtown gang and says lately he's been growing more violent. And she told us that the reason why she was coming forward at this time is that she was scared for her life and that of her unborn son. Carlita pleads with him to arrest Chubbuck quickly. He had uh, threatened her and other family members that uh, even if he wasn't around, if they ever talked to law enforcement, that uh, his gang would uh, kill them and other members of their family or else create great harm to their family. The confrontation agents wanted to avoid is seconds away. When a violent robber hits 14 banks in the Albuquerque area, police and the FBI struggle to ID the man. The case stalls until a witness comes forward. FBI agents interview the wife of prime suspect Byron Chubbuck. Carlita tells Special Agent John Tanberg that she feels safe to talk because Chubbuck's left the area. But she's wrong. During the course of the interview, we heard a vehicle pull up outside. She looked uh, out the window and said, it's him. The agents decide to hide in the bedroom to avoid a confrontation that could make Chubbuck turn violent. 
Special Agent Scott Campbell. We'd already made plans uh, prior to the interview that should he be there or we encounter him, we would affect a probable cause arrest or a warrantless arrest. When we moved into the bedroom, both myself and Agent Tambor unholstered our weapons to affect this arrest, should it come to that. I couldn't see him from where I was standing, but I could hear his voice. Also, I could see her, and I knew that she was telling him that we were in there. The agents have no way out. Confrontation with this violent thief is inevitable. When you uh, undergo this type of activity, you uh, time changes its dimension in split second, seemed like about five minutes. two rounds through the common wall back at Chubbuck, or at least where I thought he was. He uh, paused in his shooting for a period of time, and I had uh, become aware that possibly a half dozen rounds had gone off, and uh, it appeared that he was reloading. And I was prepared in a position to uh, shoot him if he did come into the room. A figure appears. Thinking that was Chubbuck, I began to pull the trigger. I realized it was her, and I was able to deflect the, the shot as the trigger was being squeezed off. You all right? You, you OK? You sure? Yeah. OK, stay right here. They clear the place. He's gone. It's amazing that, that there weren't any injuries sustained by myself and, and Scott Campbell. I think we uh, uh, both acknowledged that uh, a greater power was watching over us that day because we had uh, bullets that were coming through the wall at us, uh, firing all through the room. And uh, we didn't, uh, didn't uh, sustain any injuries of significance. Target house, thank you. Carlita is unharmed, though the bullet was so close it cut off some of her hair. The agents stay where they are. Not knowing where Chubbuck was, we made the decision to stay inside the apartment where at least we had a defensive uh, firing position set up should he return to the apartment. Local police are called to the scene. They rush to the aid of the FBI agents and secure the area. The Albuquerque Police Department the uniformed officers arrive and set up a little perimeter for us. We make contact with them verbally, and then we get out of the apartment. Agents send the pregnant woman to a hospital to be checked out. Police fan out across the neighborhood to find out if anyone saw Chubbuck leave the area. No one reports seeing him go, and his car's still there. Lieutenant Terry Ward was in charge of the Albuquerque Police Department Special Investigations Division. It wasn't looking good that this was going to end peacefully. Given his past, his willingness to fight with police officers, the fact that he had just engaged in a gunfight with armed uh, bureau investigators gave us an indication that this might be his, you know, how to say, a last stand. Then an officer spots Chubbuck at the window of another apartment in the same building and a standoff begins. Chubbuck is two apartments down from Carlita's, completely surrounded, but not ready to give up. Police Department had their hostage negotiator on the scene, uh, trying to work with him, trying to get him to surrender, uh, but there was no response. The authorities outside don't know it yet. The gunman keeps moving, making his way back to the scene of the shootout. Byron, it's the FBI. 
For three tense hours, there's no response from Chubbuck. But then Chubbuck makes a break from Carlita's apartment. Took him down with a beanbag round from a shotgun. That's a, a round that's not a lethal form, but it will stun a person. Amazingly, throughout the entire ordeal, no one is injured. Investigators arrest Chubbuck and transport him to the FBI office for booking. Byron Chubbuck pleads guilty to 14 counts of bank robbery, plus assault on federal agents, and is sentenced to 40 years in prison. Agents recover only a few dollars of the cash he stole. We never believed that uh, money was being used to feed starving children, in particular, in retrospect, after getting to know Byron Chubbuck, the last thing he would do would be to feed starving children. His main interest was to feed his narcotics habit. But Chubbuck doesn't plan to spend the next 40 years in jail. On December 21st, 2000, he announces he wants to fire his court-appointed lawyers and withdraw his guilty plea, a calculated move one which requires him to attend a court hearing. U.S. Marshal Senior Inspector Eric Neighbor. After the hearing that day, um, he was being transported back to the Santa Fe Correctional Facility in Santa Fe County. He had obtained a handcuff key and was able to unlock his restraints from his hands and from his ankles and was able to kicked the van window out and escaped through the van window. The driver heard a bang, and when he looked to see where it was, he thought he was in a traffic accident of some sort, um, saw that Byron was halfway out the window. The guards try to stop him, but he's moving fast, and they can't leave the other prisoners. Byron Chubbuck is on the run. On December 21st, 2000, convicted bank robber Byron Chubbuck escapes in Albuquerque, New Mexico. U.S. Marshal Senior Inspector Eric Neighbor. There were shots fired at Byron Chubbuck after he escaped by the correctional officers, but we don't believe that he was struck by any of those rounds. Albuquerque police helped coordinate a massive manhunt. There was a huge amount of law enforcement activity trying to find him. There was dogs searching the area, there was helicopters, there was door-to-door -door searches. There was a lot of police officers on the ground trying to find him. A helicopter systematically searches for Chubbuck by flying in an aerial grid above the area where he escaped. It is clear that Chubbuck is dangerous. The FBI knows that a desperate man on the run is capable of anything. They need to find him quickly before innocent people are harmed. As time passes with no sign of the fugitive, they are forced to widen the search area. Investigators from six agencies try to lock the area down. They set up roadblocks. They search street by street, house by house. Despite the massive effort, they come up empty. Soon they learn why. A local woman calls police to report she'd been carjacked. She says an hour earlier, a man fitting Chubbuck's description forced her into her car. He ordered her to drive him to the outskirts of town where he released her unharmed. She's able to tell us where she dropped him off and what time, and um, gives a description of what he was wearing at that time. Investigators focus the search there, but find nothing, and call off the manhunt at 9 p.m. By now, it's been hours. He could be hundreds of miles away. We were not able to locate where he was at that night, and um, we shifted gears a little bit to go from a manhunt to more of an investigation to try and locate where he might be with interviews of family members and gang members and things like that. 
Chuba could not have disappeared without help. Investigators pressure every known associate of the fugitive, yet all they get is resistance. The infamous Brewtown gang will not give up one of their own. Because of Chubbuck's desperate, violent actions, the U.S. Marshal Service places him on their 15 most wanted list. After Chubbuck escaped, he was highly motivated to keep himself from being captured again. I believe that he would use any means at his disposal to keep himself from being put back into jail, which made him a dangerous person. For days, the FBI watches places where the gang is known to hang out. They are looking for any suspicious activity. And they continue talking to people on the street. The FBI also monitors any recent bank robberies to see if Chubbuck has struck again. But the robber is strangely silent. For more than a week, there's no sign of the fugitive. Law enforcement knows Chubbuck has a heavy drug habit. Soon he'll need cash for more methamphetamines, a drug that makes the user feel powerful, paranoid, and super aggressive. To get the money, authorities believe he will begin robbing banks again, which will aid the effort to locate and apprehend the fugitive. While under the influence of the drug, there's no telling what he'll do next. We felt that it was, um, he was the highest priority to get back into custody. But some investigators suspect Chubbuck is no longer in the country. Albuquerque Police Department Lieutenant Terry Ward. He had uh, connections in Mexico. He could have easily fled to Mexico and hidden there. Uh, I didn't really think he would stay in the metropolitan area because his name and face was very familiar to everybody. Put the money in the bag! On January 16, 2001, a year and five months since his last heist, Chubbuck bursts back onto the scene in his old neighborhood. He robs a stunning six Albuquerque banks in a single day. A week later, he robs three more over two days. Special Agent John Tanberg has chased him from the beginning. Chubbuck was uh, a very, very brazen robber. Uh, he robbed uh, banks that uh, had been previously robbed by him. He didn't seem to care that the uh, uh, bank employees knew him already. Each time, he brags to his victims that he's robbing the hood. Robbing the hood, baby! Robbing the hood! <laughs> and each time, the police and FBI find no evidence. Nothing that could lead them to their elusive bank robber. He became more and more successful in his robberies, and he was more and more in the position to taunt law enforcement. We didn't receive significant physical evidence during the course of these robberies, and they occurred uh, very often. With each new heist, the fugitive's legend grows. The investigation trying to apprehend Byron Chubbuck was the biggest case in Albuquerque uh, in recent time. He was featured uh, almost every night on the local news with um, pictures and photographs and um, Crime Stoppers telephone numbers and things like that to try and help um, apprehend him. And we got a lot of phone calls um, about his whereabouts or possible whereabouts. Although agents chase every lead, Chubbuck remains elusive. The FBI suspects members of his Brewtown gang are protecting him. A dangerous band of hardened criminals, the gang has the network to hide a fugitive and the means to fight back. Albuquerque investigators are hunting for Byron Chubbuck, a violent bank robber on the run after a brazen escape from jail. He's being chased by multiple agencies, according to U.S. Marshal Senior Inspector Eric Neighbor. The Albuquerque Police Department, the FBI, and the United States Marshal Service 
entered into a um, task force to aid each other in uh, apprehending Byron Chovic. We pulled our resources together so there wouldn't be um, three different departments searching for the same person. Despite a massive manhunt, Chubbuck is continuing to rob banks in Albuquerque. Albuquerque Police Department Lieutenant Terry Ward. He was robbing banks and getting away with it, so as long as he kept getting away with it, he would keep doing it. And that was one of the reasons we, we got together with the other agencies, and that he had to be stopped. He wasn't going to stop on his own. Uh, he wasn't going to leave, so he was still creating a problem for us. Securing warrants, investigators tapped the phones of several of Chubbuck's associates. Intercepted conversations suggest the fugitive has fled across the border to Mexico. The FBI alerts the Border Patrol and contacts the Mexican Federal Police, asking them to watch for Chubbuck. Then agents intercept calls that indicate Chubbuck is back in Albuquerque. But the conversations are vague, with no direct reference to where he's hiding. Investigators maintain pressure on the Brewtown gang, making it clear that no one will have a moment's rest until Chubbuck is back in custody. It works. Early in the morning on February 5th, 2001, someone drops off a letter at a local radio station. It's from Byron Chubbuck. T.J. Trout is the morning DJ for Albuquerque's 94 Rock. It was um, intense. It, I mean, there were a lot of emotions going on when we get this. It's like, holy shit, look at this. This, this, is, this is from Byron Chubbuck. The note said uh, he had um, conditions for his surrender that he wanted to get out to the public, but he wanted to be interviewed on 94 Rock. He wanted us to interview him on the morning show. He wanted to uh, implicate some law enforcement individuals who he thought treated him badly and tried to kill him. And he wanted all this out, and if all this was out, he would peacefully surrender. We didn't know if it was from him. We didn't know if it was just from a, a prankster. We didn't know. And right after I got the note, I went on the air with the note, and I said, look, we just received a note from somebody, and if you are who we think you are, you have to call me back at this certain number, and I'm going to ask you a few questions. And that uh, immediately, the phone rang. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, this is What's up, Doc? What do you want to know? Well, I tell you what. Uh, Are you trying to bust me? No, I'm not. Okay. No, I'm not. Be a bad thing. No, this is what I'm trying to. He do. sounded agitated, and he sounded like he was nervous. He, you know, he's like like any other guy would be that's looking over his shoulder. You know, everywhere you go, you're saying, "Well, is that a cop? Is that a cop?" If you want me to put this on Here the air. Helicopter, dude. Is that the fifth? No, it's not. There's helicopters and everything. He complains authorities are this out to too murder high. him. These feds and these marshals and these police lie. Lie, lie. Come on, give me a break. These guys started a shootout in my house with my pregnant wife. The call ends ominously. Is there any way that we can contact you? Hell no, dude. I'm, dude, I'm strapped down with so many m machine guns and all kinds of cool s***. I'm ready for whatever. I'll get a hold of you. It's clear the fugitives prepared for another firefight. The station immediately calls the authorities. I believe Chubbuck contacted the radio station to bolster his ego a little bit. Um, I think he had a need to be in the public eye with um, the publicity that was surrounding his escape. Anytime they do things to gain attention, uh, it helps the police department. If they crawl underground and we never hear nor see of them again, it makes it much more difficult to catch them. But if they're doing things like robbing banks, seeking publicity, it gives us tabs that we can start from to keep looking for them. The fugitive's ego might be his undoing, as agents now have a solid lead and physical evidence. Lab technicians find Chubbuck's fingerprint on the letter, confirming it's authentic. Investigators review the security footage from the radio station. We could tell, first of all, the person who delivered the letter was not Byron Chubbuck. 
Uh, we knew what he looked like, and this wasn't that individual. But we did have a good, clear picture of the individual that delivered it. And this uh, eventually proved the, the straw that broke the camel's back. One police detective recognizes the man as a sometime member of the Brewtown gang. His name is Ronald Baker. Our mindset was that we would follow this individual without his knowledge, and he would lead us to Byron Chubbett. The Albuquerque gang squad sets up surveillance on Baker's mobile home. At one point, they see a man who resembles Chubbuck, but it's too dark for a positive ID. Somehow, they have to get inside that trailer. On the trail of fugitive Byron Chubbuck, Albuquerque authorities surveil a mobile home they think he's hiding in. At the same time, agents learn one of Chubbuck's gang associates has been arrested on state carjacking charges. It's a good deal if you agree to wear a wire. They use tougher federal sentencing rules to pressure him to cooperate, according to Special Agent John Tanberg. We decided that uh, it would be a simple matter to charge him federally uh, so that there would be a penalty of significance. Uh, that uh, could be utilized as a means by which he would be persuaded to uh, work for us. The man doesn't want to do it, worried about gang retribution. But with no parole in the federal system, the man is looking at years of prison time. Investigators offer to revert to state charges, which would make him eligible for parole if he cooperates. In the end, his fear of prison prevails, and he agrees to turn informant. The plan is to wire the informant with a recording device and send him into the trailer to see if Chubbuck's there. Go in there, sit down, and think about the wire. We'll give you time to get comfortable with it, but these guys going to do a test on that. Just relax, get comfortable with that wire. Let's just go. It's a dangerous assignment. If the gang realizes he's cooperating, they'll likely kill him on the spot. Over the wire. Investigators listen as the informant tries to calm down the people inside. It's tense. Something's definitely going on. The informant asks about Chubbuck, but the men say he's not there. When the tension grows, it's too much. It's time for the informant to get out. At the police station, investigators debrief the informant. You said you heard something in the back room, right? Yeah, big deal. That's like his girlfriend or something. Yeah. But you don't know that. Yeah, so what are you trying to do? They're convinced yeah. Chubbuck is hiding in the trailer and persuade the informant to go back you in. Said, you are going Something's back. Something's changed. We got to go back. Don't you hide. Don't know that. All right, come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Thanks. Everyone off this and stand by. <laughs> Undercover officers stand by, ready to move in if anything goes wrong. We'll use that for new people, I guess. All units, he's definitely inside. Get back! 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 and no one gets hurt. Sorry. Sorry, man. I need a place to stay, man. Can I crash on the couch? Yeah, man. Sorry, man. Sorry. Look, man, I'm gonna tell my buds. I'll be right back, all right? Man, I hope you're all right, man. I'm sorry about that. I'm just gonna go. I'm gonna tell my buds, man. I'll be right back, all right, man? Senior Inspector Eric Neighbor. He exited the mobile home and informed police that Byron Chubbuck was indeed inside that mobile home. 
Albuquerque Police Department Lieutenant Terry Ward. The informant told us that Chubbick was very paranoid and very jumpy. Most career criminals are paranoid. They trust very few people. Uh, they're constantly looking behind their backs. They keep very low profiles. They move quite often. So they are paranoid. And sometimes it can even be a drug-induced paranoia. Immediately, members of Albuquerque PD's specially trained tactical arrest teams respond to the call, hoping the takedown will end peacefully, but well prepared if it doesn't. Members of Albuquerque's gang unit and repeat offenders program move in stealthily. to stop. Investigators scramble to contain Chubbuck, determined to stop the dangerous fugitive. But Byron Chubbuck has never given up easy. Detective Richard Lewis speeds toward the scene. Seconds later, Lewis spots the car Chubbuck's in. When Detective Lewis realized that the vehicle coming at him was indeed Byron Chubbuck, the, the person we had been looking for, he made a decision to stop the vehicle right then and there. Lewis decides to force a crash. find Chubbuck lying motionless, a Tech-9 semi-automatic handgun beside him. He's wounded by a single bullet to the chest, but he's alive. Officers arrest his accomplice, Ronald Baker, still dazed from the crash. Detectives then trace the rounds that missed. Several pierced a nearby trailer while residents slept inside. But when police check on them, everyone's fine. There was a great sense of relief because this investigation and the publicity and all the long hours had come to this crescendo and it had ended as it should. With the, the good guys weren't hurt and the bad guy was hurt and he was in custody. Special Agent Scott Campbell. In the end, Chubbuck showed his true colors. He wasn't the uh, Robin the Hood mythical character that we dubbed him as, and he started believing. He was actually the violent felon that he is. Chubbuck is later convicted of multiple charges, including escape, robbery, and assault with a weapon. A federal judge adds 40 years to his original 40-year sentence. He fully recovers from the gunshot wound that stopped his crime spree. During the investigation, during our research and our background check, I had the opportunity to uh, read some of his correspondence. Very intelligent man. He could be a very successful civilian, living a very productive life. But for some reason, he chose to go into robbing banks. And he was very good at it for a short while. And his greed and his ego is eventually what led to his downfall. Byron Chubbuck was quick to fire, threatening agents' lives. But because investigators never gave up, he's no longer a risk to anyone outside the prison system. <laughs> 